It's a ple pleasure for me to be here uh, at the 10th anniversary of AdFesc. As soon as uh, Roy invited me, I, I knew I had to come, and, and I'm really glad I did. So I will talk about um, you know, the, the things that led to AdFesc. So a lot of it is ancient history. You know, being old, I, I tend to focus on the older things, nostalgia, you know. So please bear with me. Um, how we created at PESC, and, um, and then some thoughts about the curriculum for computational science and engineering at universities, and then some random things um, to um, wrap up. So the, uh, the inspiration started out with the establishment of the Argonne Research Computing Facility. So that's the precursor of the ALCF. And um, I'm going to be using some slightly modified slides that were first presented um, in 2013, in July, or rather in May of 2013, just before the first ATPES program. Um, so uh, backing up, you know, why parallelism? Why did we create the ACRF? Well, this was a, a period when in the late 70s and, and early 80s, there was a blossoming of ideas of parallel architectures. Uh, there was a lot of funding from DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency, and also the Department of Energy, and um, a little bit later, the National Science Foundation. And so people were thinking up all kinds of different parallel computer architectures. And, um, so, um, you know, one of the key ones was uh, Jeffrey Fox's work at Caltech, uh, Dave Cook at uh, Urbana, uh, Jack Schwartz at um, NYU Courant Institute. And um, I sort of knew about this a little bit. In fact, I programmed the, the ELIAC-4 for um, a um, material scientist chemist at Argonne, Anis Rahman, who had gotten time on the ELIAC-4. He asked me to program it for him. So I, I was aware of it, but what really came home to me about the importance of parallel computers was a talk that Jack Schwartz gave at a program manager's meeting in Washington uh, in um, 1981 or 82. And, and so that uh, just galvanized me. And I had recently founded the Math and Computer Science Division, so I held a division meeting and I said, essentially, um, our software is used worldwide, mathematical software primarily, uh, but if we're going to remain relevant, we need to modify so it works on parallel computers or we won't be relevant anymore. So, um, and um, you had to have real hardware to be able to try things out on because you know, people have been writing papers on parallel algorithms for hypothetical parallel computers, um, but as soon as they started running them on the machines as they started to became a, become available, they found that most of their algorithms just didn't work well. Um, a very famous mathematician, Ahmed Sameh, who had been you know, publishing papers, you know, came to Argonne and told me, Paul, I, I have to start over again. Uh, all these algorithms based on hypothetical architectures just don't work. And so, you know, fortunately, um, we, um, uh, you know, colleagues uh, who were in my division, like Jack Dongera, Rusty Lusk, Ross Overbeek, and Danny Sorensen primarily, and myself decided, well, let's try to get m funding so that we can have a menagerie of parallel computers and be able to use real ones and develop algorithms that actually work. Now, the uh, lab director at the time was Walter Massey, and um, he and the associate lab director, uh, Ken Cleaver, uh, were good enough to fund uh, a, uh, an LDRD, that's a lab director's discretionary research uh, funding program that I submitted. And um, so there's Jimmy Carter, who's the president of the United States, uh, shaking uh, Walter Massey's hand congratulating Walter Massey for funding that LDRD. Do you believe that? No, he, he was congratulating him for something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but I'd like to believe it. No. So, um, um, so having um, gotten that in place, then we thought, well, we, we should make it available nationally and, in fact, internationally. And um, so um, we wanted a, a variety of them because it was way too early to know which ones would be dominant. In fact, at that time, shared memory computers were thought to be the answer. They were easier to program. Um, now, you did have to worry about some things like stepping on your code and your data and getting the wrong answers, but you know, there were ways to avoid that. And I actually had to fight a little bit to buy some distributed memory computers um, as, um, because you know, those were also a, po a potential. Of course, that turned out to be the winning architecture for very large systems uh, for technical reasons. So um, having gotten a start with um, lab directors with discretionary funds, of course, now we needed more. And so I went to Don Austin, who was head of what is now the Oscar part of the uh, Department of Energy. At that time, it was called Applied Mathematical Sciences. And um, um, he said he'd be interested in, or he'd be willing to consider a proposal to set up a facility and fund it and to fund research associated with parallel algorithms for mathematical applications. And so he had it reviewed, funded it, and so we had now the ACRF. Well, um, I've already said much of what I wanted to, on, uh, so I won't read all of this slide, but it lasted for um, eight years. and. I believe had uh, a lot of impact. Uh, I'll allude to that a little bit later. Now, there were a lot of interesting machines. Uh, you know, at one time I think there were eight machines in the ACRF. But the thing is, how do you program them? This was way before MPI or OpenMP, or of course Raja and Kokos and so on that you heard about today. Um, and there just there wasn't a lot of experience. Um, just some theoretical work which turned out not to be particularly useful. So um, the guys in the, the Math and Computer Science Division, however, had ideas. And so Jack Dongera and Danny Sorensen came up with a graph-oriented approach, which uh, even now is you know, part of the plasma and is used in, in many other cases. Um, and then um, Rus Rusty Lusk and Ross Overbeek came up with um, essentially a pool of jobs and, and uh, servers. And that eventually morphed into the ADLB, the Asynchronous Dynamic Load Balancing Library that uh, Rusty and a colleague developed. Um, and uh, you know, the colleague that was interacting with Rusty a lot was uh, Stephen Piper, a physicist who needed you know, massive parallelism and for whom load balancing was a real issue. And so they, they worked on it together, and as, uh, as stated here, um, it, it scales to actually over a million processes. So um, that's running today. Um, so having made progress on how to program these parallel computers, having a bunch of parallel computers that people could actually use, then the idea came up of let's do some outreach and teach short courses um, for anybody who's interested. So a precursor of the AtBesk. Uh, the NSF funded some two-week summer institutes and then internally we funded just short three-day courses every six weeks. So the summer institutes, as I mentioned, was sponsored by NSF. They were held for three years. And um, not too different from this one. Um, afternoons were hands-on, and we had you know, very well-known speakers um, to give lectures and work with the students. Um, and so we consider AtBest to be really a, a follow-on to those two-week summer institutes. Uh, but they were small. There were only about 20 uh, students. And so you can see the pictures of the three years of the students who participated and some of the lecturers. Whereas the high volume approach was these three-day courses 
Um, and um, lots and lots of people participated. So um, I think it's a little bit uh, exaggerating maybe, but it, I do think it introduced a, a generation of people to parallel computing. Now, two particular people that I'd like to mention who participated are Barb Helland and uh, Bill Harrod. So uh, they both mentioned to me over the years that they came to those courses and it changed their career. And they had a pretty good career. Barb Helland, uh, for the last several years, has been the head of applied of the Oscar uh, uh, division. I, I, and you know, so she currently has a budget of a, a billion dollars a year. You know, all the big facilities, ALCF, OLCF, Berkeley, and so on, and the research programs. So she did pretty well. And Bill Harrod, you know, was a DARPA manager, program manager. Then uh, before that, he worked for um, uh, Cray and SGI that bought Cray for a while. Um, and he's currently an IARPA program manager. Uh, so he also did pretty well. Now, so that, that's what you can look forward to by having taken uh, this course, right? Well, of course, it may be that you don't want to be a government bureaucrat. <laughs> it could happen. Although, I, actually, I, I had two stints of um, running things from the headquarters side um, as a detailee, and um, one can do interesting things. But the, the secret of it was that it, I only agreed to do it for two years at a time and not stay. If I'd stayed longer, I would have gone crazy. But two years is fine. OK, so, um, so that was you know, the ALCF, I'm sorry, the ACRF schools were definitely a model for this program. Uh, but uh, also some uh, grid summer schools that um, I was involved in in the early 2000s. So grid computing, which morphed into cloud computing, um, was uh, of great interest. Um, initially uh, at CERN for the uh, high energy physics uh, research community, which is worldwide, and, and they needed convenient ways to be able to share the data, the programs to analyze the data, and um, uh, you know, come up with results. And there are people from you know, 50 different countries that use uh, the accelerators at CERN. So uh, that was part of it, and, and in fact, the uh, CERN Summer School was one of the models. Um, and in those days, um, it seemed to be a little bit easier to collaborate among countries, and, and so without a lot of trouble, uh, a colleague of mine and I were put in a proposal jointly to the National Science Foundation in the U.S., and the European Union in um, Europe, and um, again, it was an unsolicited proposal but it got funded. And so um, this is part of the program for the, the first one. And um, now we decided to locate it in a hotel on the Sorrento Peninsula in Italy. It was a, a hard choice and you know, very, <laughs> very hard labor. But uh, it, it, it was a little bit like this in the sense that uh, it was isolated. You, you could see the Mediterranean below, it was up on a hill. Uh, but it was hard to get to it, and uh, uh, not, not a lot of roads in, in and out. Uh, but, you know, people did enjoy the location. Okay, so those two models were from, you know, the beginning of lots of parallel architectures. How do we program them, learn to use them, grid computing, how do you set up grids, how do you use them? And um, so come the early 2010s, uh, I, at that time, I was director of science for the ALCF and in contact with a lot of users and the people who supported the users on a daily basis. And it seemed to me that there was training missing from, uh, for these users in a lot of things that would make their lives easier um, and so they'd be more productive and get the results they needed. So. Um, um, you know, clearly, you know, rather than invent something new, I thought, how about another summer school program? And um, I used the, the same kind of approach. First, I sounded out some colleagues, you know, is this makes sense? You know, am I wrong? Maybe 
there already are training programs of this type, but there weren't. And so then I um, met with a couple of program managers at the DOE headquarters and um, just orally said, you know, I, I think this would be important and, and useful. Would you consider funding it? And they said, write a proposal. Um, so I um, did that, uh, and, and that was easy to do. It, first of all, it was only three pages, I think, and you know, we had already been thinking about it. Uh, and um, so um, it um, was reviewed. Um, the reviews were good enough, and, and it got funded. So the request was for about $1.2 million for three years. So it's a, you know, a little bit under 400,000 uh, per year. Um, now that money, and even today, that comes from headquarters or today the ECP, is to fund the use of these facilities, your sleeping rooms, your meals, um, the um, national travel to get here. Um, and um, travel for the, the lecturers. Um, it doesn't cover any of the people's time at Argonne. And I can tell you, and Ray will tell you ad nauseum, there's a lot of effort needed to run a, this program from you know, when you start advertising it, get the applications, evaluate the applications, and making all the arrangements. It's a lot of work, but Argonne Lab and uh, the sales directorate in particular that has math and computer science division, ALCF and so on, strongly believe it's important. And so Argonne has been funding those people's time, uh, fortunately, and um, I believe they will continue to do that. So the things that I was set on is that it would be an in-person program, and of course, for, I don't know, was it one year or two years, that, two years that uh, you couldn't do it in person because of the pandemic? That I understand, but you know, there were proposals to have the you know, massive open and online course format. I said, no, thank you. Uh, that won't accomplish what we need to accomplish. Um, a moderate number of participants, you know, typically 60 to 80, which is still small enough that there can be interactions. And, and I've seen that today and yesterday. You're, you're willing to ask questions and interact with the lecturers and with each other. And, and that's important. Um, getting lecturers who are leaders in their fields uh, and a very broad curriculum. Now I know that the days are long here. You haven't even been here a full week and you're probably tired. But uh, I, you know we really wanted to give you a broad spectrum exposure to things that you might not need this year or next year, but you probably will at some point and you'll remember and then you can dig into it. So um, initially I thought daydreaming, it really should be a, a month long program, but that wasn't realistic. Now, <laughs> bureaucratic things can get in the way. We, uh, I really wanted to call it a, a summer school for exascale computing. That was the goal, right? But no, you can't use the word school because then people in Congress would say, oh, that's something either the National Science Foundation should be doing or the Department of Education. So, so it's a training program, it's not a school. Um, and you can't say exascale because, um, uh, and that I think is more reasonable you know, that's a very fixed thing. So extreme scale is a sliding scale. You know, you can say extreme scale forever. <laughs> so they were right about that change. Um, so to define the curriculum, um, a bunch of us got together and, and worked on that. And the, the curriculum has stayed pretty much the same at a high level. Now, obviously, the, the um, details have changed year by year. The computers have changed, the programming models and frameworks have changed. Some of the tools, uh, debugging tools and so on have as well. And um, application targets like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, were not part of what people were interested in nine years ago, but they definitely are now. Um, as far as attendees, um, I'd say the um, 
demographics are fairly similar, but one thing that I was pleased to notice, at least in, in your group, there are more computer scientists. Now, initially we were loath to uh, admit computer scientists because we wanted people who you know, had scientific or engineering applications to solve. Um, but computer science has also evolved in this context of extreme computing. And the fact that people with, who are computer scientists are applying, or, um, I think, is an indication of that. So that's a change that I noticed and that I was pleased to see. Now, there are you know, lots of um, computer architectures now, uh, perhaps even more than in the 80s. Well, no, not more than in the 80s, but uh, the, you know, one of the NSF programs uh, in the mid-90s, in fact, was funded, I think it was 25 uh, short studies of different architectures. I don't know that any of them survived, but there were a lot of ideas out there. So the first at BESC was uh, the summer of 2013, and um, there's the, um, the photo, uh, similar to the one that we took earlier today. In uh, the middle, in the uh, light yellow shirt, is Rusty Lusk. Uh, Rusty you know, was deeply involved in the original a ACRF, in the courses, and in bringing this uh, program up to speed from the beginning. Um, uh, Rusty passed away um, in May of this year, uh, <clears throat> a very big loss for our community. So a few anecdotes. Um, I mean, I, one of the things that I enjoyed when I was um, involved in uh, these training programs for the entire time, I think uh, for the first three or four, uh, is seeing you know, the graduate students, postdocs, um, being able to ask questions of you know, leaders in the fields uh, of the lecturers and, uh, and working with them side by side. Um, uh, and that to me um, you know, really made me feel, it, it validated the concept that this should be not too many people, it should be in person and with lots of hands on. And so uh, you see images like this uh, are typical. Uh, also, um, you know, one of the things that pleased me is you know, one of the participants a few years ago had been a staff member at a national lab for 20 years, and yet he came and he found that he learned enough. And uh, in fact, he liked it enough that he has um, recruited other people from his lab or convinced them to apply, and, and a number of them have um, come and, and participated in this program. And, and so that's something I had not expected. And um, another thing was, um, two graduate students who attended maybe the first or, or possibly the second, um, the next year they submitted um, papers to the uh, supercomputing conference, which is really hard to get accepted, and, and their papers were accepted, and they believed that it was the credit uh, should be given to their having learned so much in this program. Um, now, um, I occasionally in, in my career have um, gotten, if not bored, just felt that I'd done enough of a particular thing and I needed to move on to do something else. So in 2015, early in the year, maybe in the spring, I thought I'd, I'd been director of science at ALCF far too long. It was time for somebody else to do that. But I wasn't ready to retire. What I wanted to do was to work with universities, and, uh, and I'd, I had identified quite a few. Some were near Chicago, but some were not, and work with them on building up their curriculum for undergraduate, but primarily for graduate students, to include more of the content of this program, but of course, in much greater depth, such as one can do in a university course, and um, uh, come up with you know, computational science PhDs 
which could be tailored to what the science was, you know, whether it's physics or, or chemistry or material science, um, whatever. Uh, so that was what I was planning to do, but in July of 2015, in fact, I, I was on vacation in Italy, which is my native country, and I was um, on a boat, a uh, friend's boat, uh, on a cruise in the Mediterranean, and I got a call asking me would I be willing to establish and lead the Exascale Computing Project for the United States. Now, I'd been involved in some of the early work in putting ideas together for this project, uh, the Exascale Computing Project, and so I accepted, even though it meant uh, I wasn't going to do a more leisurely uh, kind of work for the following two years. Uh, but of course, I haven't regretted that. Um, so I never did do anything about the university curricula, but other people did. And so I wanted to point you to an article that's based on a report of a workshop. So the workshop took place in 2014. The article, the report, I think, was published in 2015 or 16. Um, but the article that I'm pointing you to wasn't published until um, 2018. And so it's in the SIAM uh, Review, Society for Industrial Applied Mathematics a Review. It's called Research and Education in Computational Science and Engineering. Um, one of the four people that's um, an author is Lois McInnes from Argonne, who I, I believe took part in um, putting together part of the program for this year's AtFesc, in fact. Um, so this report, I'll, I'll just pick out a, a parts of a table from the report, which laid out what um, the workshop and, and the authors felt were, what, what would you expect a student graduating from a PhD program to be able to do? And so um, yeah, examples are, of course, my slides are online so you can see them. Be aware of available tools and techniques from software engineering. And that's something uh, you'll be exposed to next week. Uh, of course, combine mathematical modeling, physical principles, and data to the derived models. Uh, uh, in depth, um, graduate level uh, depth for uh, figuring out new methods. Um, uh, let's see, uh, new tools and methods to represent and visualize computational results. You'll get quite a few lectures on visualization and on. Uh, at the bottom, understand data as a core asset in computational research. Again, there, I think there's a full day on, on data issues in this program. Um, be able to communicate across disciplines and collaborate in a team. Um, you may have noticed some of that here, although possibly not, but um, chances are in your careers, if you're not already working in a team, you will be, at least part of your career, because a lot of what we do these days requires a team, often a multidisciplinary team, and so being able to understand each other is quite important. Um, so those are, um, ju that's just a snippet from that report. Uh, uh, so I, I would recommend that you read it in, in your spare time. It isn't very long, and uh, it's well written and talks a lot about the field of computational science research, as well as curricula. Okay, so some random topics. Um, I mentioned several times that things that I, um, I was able to get started originated as unsolicited proposals. You know, the ACRF was, the grid schools were, this program was. Um, yesterday, Pete Beckman uh, talked briefly about Charlie Catlett's uh, urban science uh, smart cities project. That was, you know, Charlie coming up with the idea and then pitching it. It was an unsolicited proposal. There, there wasn't a call for, hey, we want proposals in smart cities. Um, of course, now there are such calls. So um, I would encourage you to consider doing that uh, in your careers. You know, if you have an idea and you don't see a, an existing funding source, don't give up. Instead, you know, try to get to a program manager 
Um, preferably, you know, don't write a full lengthy proposal without knowing whether it would even be read. But um, do that. I, I found that can work. Now, you know, later in my career, I, I, I had a reputation, and so it was easier for me. But for the ACRF, that was a long time ago. That was 40 years ago. And still I was able to do it. So can you. Now, a little quiz. Uh, I know that there are some uh, chemistry people here, so you might know the answer to this. When was the first Nobel Prize awarded that relied crucially on computational science? I've already given a hint. It had to do with chemistry. Anybody know that? Huh? Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, what year? Um, okay, no, I was much earlier than that. Yeah, there have been about six Nobel Prizes that I, I believe can definitely be tied to this was computational stuff. Uh, the most recent one was in uh, 2013, Martin Karplus for CHARM, basically, for the, the CHARM program. Okay, so it was 1962. And it was done on a computer that started being built in the late 40s in Cambridge. Now, um, some of you may know that uh, you know, there was a computer called the ENIAC, which started working in early, late 44, but was turned on um, for open work uh, in 1945 at the University of Pennsylvania. And so the ENIAC is considered by many to be the first modern computer because it was electronic uh, and uh, it was program driven. Whereas things like the Harvard uh, Mark I uh, was electronic, but it wasn't program driven. You had to have people to um, make it uh, go from one step of a computation to another manually. So there was ENIAC and John von Neumann uh, got interested in that and found out that the, the team at the University of Pennsylvania was designing um, uh, <clears throat> EDVAC as a successor. Um, and von Neumann thought this is great and he contributed to some of the ideas. Um, the stored program model is often known as a John von Neumann model where you store in the same memory the program and the data that the program acts on. Now, to you that may seem obvious, but it wasn't at the time. Um, and, and so, um, and von Neumann felt that it was okay for his ideas to be open and free. So when people heard about this EDVAC idea and then uh, von Neumann was designing one for um, Princeton, because he was a, at Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Studies, um, he came up with something called the IAS computer, and he uh, would give away uh, the, the blueprints and the, speci the preliminary specifications to anybody who wanted it. Um, and so somebody in Cambridge, England, found out about EDVAC and got the, um, the plans at the time and um, built EDSAC, which was running before EDVAC as well. And this guy, John Kendrew, was trying to determine the structure of a protein. And it was dealing, you know, had, had figured out, along with um, um, Perutz, uh, a way to get uh, X-ray sp spectra that would have the right information, but there were many, many of them. And to do them by, to analyze them by hand was to do the computations necessary to get the three-dimensional structure by hand, which is not practical. Fortunately, somebody told him about EDSAC was working, and so he and a colleague, um, colleague's name was uh, John Bennett, uh, wrote a program for EDSAC and for the first time determined the structure of a protein, my myoglobin. And so that was data intensive in those days because 250,000 X-ray reflections uh, was a lot. Um, and so got a Nobel Prize in 1962. So there's a trivia question for you. 
uh, to stump your friends with. Now, um, unrelated to that, but in the same time frame, namely 1945, um, I wanted to mention this because I, I recently was asked to write a review for Siam News of a book called A New History of Modern Computing. And I really enjoyed the book. Uh, the review will be published in September. Uh, but one of the things that I learned that I wasn't aware of was this essay by Vannevar Bush called As We May Think that started out as an essay that he wrote to a friend. And then the friend convinced Bush to publish it in a magazine called The Atlantic. The Atlantic is still in print, but uh, it's still being published. Uh, now, uh, what is amazing to me is that Bush predicted a lot of things that only in the last few years have become available and we think of as being revolutionary. How he came up with that, I don't know, because it's, it, it's a little bit hard to grasp in a few cases, but mostly, you know, hypertext, you know, personal computers, the internet, the World Wide Web, even Google Docs, um, online encyclopedias. All of that is in this roughly seven or eight page essay. Um, so that's just something I wanted to mention because I, I ran across it relatively recently and was amazed by it. Now I had known about Vannevar Bush for a long time because he wrote a report for President, it was meant for President Roosevelt um, um, that was titled Science, the Endless Frontier. Now, Roosevelt wrote a letter. I don't know how much Roosevelt himself composed of that letter, but he wrote a letter in which he asked Vannevar Bush to address these four topics. And so the, you know, the first one is, you know, uh, now that the war is over, or it was about to be over, uh, you know, what can we reveal to the world um, that was developed for military purposes but might be good for other things. And then uh, healthcare. There were a lot of advances in healthcare which saved hundreds of thousands of lives of soldiers. Um, and um, so Roosevelt wanted to continue this push in using science for healthcare. Um, and then shouldn't the government be continuing to fund research even though there's not a war going on. That's number three. And number four, you know, how can we have effective programs for developing scientific talent in American youth, let me say global youth, so that there's a future for scientific research. Um, and um, so Vannevar Bush came up with this, it's only a 40 page report, Science, the Endless Frontier, and it's um, well worth reading. They're, both of these are available freely online. You might enjoy them as you're uh, relaxing after the grueling two weeks of this course. <laughs> now, amazing predictions by Vannevar Bush, but not all of them are that accurate. So here's one that I made in, in the first at -Pesk program. This was one of the slides that I showed um, in um, July of 2013. So one thing I got right, if you look at the top uh, right, that the first exascale system would be in 2022. Yeah. And uh, in 2013, there was a lot of argument about that. Um, um, but I got a lot of things wrong. A key one is the number of nodes at that time, we thought there would be a huge number of pretty small nodes. But in fact, as you know, um, we've gotten into really fat nodes and much fewer than 100,000 or a million. So I was way off on that. Um, some of the other ones are not too far off, but you know, many things are off. Uh, so I'm no Vannevar Bush. Uh, however, I did better than, than the Rand Corporation. So the Rand Corporation in the mid-50s said in the, by 2004, a home computer might be like this. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so um, in closing, uh, if you have any feedback, I know you get formal requests for feedback almost continuously <laughs> uh, uh, for this program, and, and for a good reason. We really want to know um, your feedback and how we could improve. Um, so I just want to urge you to, um, to give us that feedback. And I want to thank you for participating in the program. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. So with the Exascale Computing Project winding down, are you planning on going back into trying to discuss with the other university curricula about computer science and engineering programs? Um, well, no, I'm, uh, I'm actually retired. Uh, uh, I, I do a little bit of work, professional work, uh, uh, but um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not um, engaged in regular work. So I, I have some consulting, um, and um, I serve on some a couple of advisory committees and um, do things like the book review for SIAM, lectures like this. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for that question. I, if I were uh, you know, 10 years younger, I would. <laughs> uh, it's something that's um, you know, very dear to me, but uh, uh, other people have been doing it. I, I should have mentioned, in fact, that Mike Papka, I don't know if you've, uh, you, yeah, he was here already, and um, he's very interested in that, and he's yeah, been he, doing work at here, NIU. And, he was here Tuesday night. Pardon? He was here Tuesday night. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ray and, uh, and and so um, yeah, Mike uh, has certainly been um, pushing in, in some of those directions. So I, I leave it to uh, other more vigorous people, and I'll I'll watch it from a distance. But uh, yeah, it's something that um, I think is very important. Uh, you know, there are you know PhD courses and things now that, of course, there there weren't a hundred years ago. You know, you get a PhD in math a hundred years ago and in physics and in chemistry, but uh, in, um, probably not in material science, at least it wouldn't be called that at the time. And uh, certainly not in computer science 100 years ago. Even when I decided to go to graduate school, I, it was such an early time for a computer science PhD programs. I looked at the curriculum and I'd been a math major and still seemed pretty similar to a math PhD and so I decided to stick with math, PhD, and I, but I did get involved in computer science while I was getting my PhD in math. Yeah, curricula are important and um, uh, I believe they are being developed. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I also noticed, like in my city, there's several good universities, but as far as I can tell, there's just basically no supercomputing courses in undergrad or graduate. And what do you think are the big reasons for that or barriers for that, and why isn't that happening more? Well, um, universities. Um, tend to be more rigid in disciplinary focuses than um, places like national labs. I mean, in national labs, it's um, uh, fairly common that people from different divisions work together on a project. Um, in universities, some universities like to say that they have um, you know, very low barriers uh, and then they do have faculty who are have appointments in two or three different departments, and that can help with teaching the right kind of courses. But uh, um, I, I would say on the whole, you know, there's a tendency to be discipline-oriented by department and, and sticking to you know, more traditional things. And so when it comes to computational science, which tends to span different things, um, that uh, isn't adopted so much as a course. And, and then computer science, although I think that's changed some, but there was a long period, of, you know, several decades that 
computer science departments wanted to avoid contact with computers. I mean, you know, they, they didn't want their students to be programming computers. They wanted to just learn about, you know, interesting, uh, elegant ways to program in the abstract um, and have concepts, uh, but not actually get your hands dirty. And yet, to me, computer science is almost like an engineering discipline. You, you need to do things with real hardware to learn. So those are some of my observations. Uh, you know, some of you probably know that the Department of Energy, uh, you know, in fact, the Oscar part, has for something like 25 years been funding something called a um, CSGF, the Computational Science Graduate Fellowships. And the way that works is, you know, the people who are selected then uh, staff that runs the CSGF program work with the university where the person is getting a PhD to try to cobble up a curriculum that will end up being you know, computational science plus X, where X might be biology or physics and, and so on. So you, you have to do that because there isn't a, already a, a program like that. Um, even you know, computational biology, uh, there, are, there are PhDs in that, and a few places have a computational physics degrees, uh, but uh, not too many, though. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so you talked about uh, making predictions, and <coughs> people in the past making predictions, so I'm just wondering uh, what your predictions for, let's say, five years the future of uh, computers and what problems uh, computational scientists like us might face? Well, um, one of the hopes that I have for the next five years is that there will be a lot more research on microarchitectures. Um, you know, we, we all know that you know, Moore's Law is coming to an end and ours scaling has come to an end. But you know, there's still a, a lot of progress to be made, in my opinion, by you know, designing circuits, chiplets, that are specialized in a way, but embedded in a general purpose uh, multi-chip system. So that, that's what I mean by micro architecture. And um, so if uh, there are is progress in that, investment and then progress in that, which I believe could take place within a five-year period, then you may find that those systems are easier to program and, and in particular easier to get very good performance from because of the partial specialization. I mean, even now you see hybrids of, you know, straight chips um, <clears throat> interface with FPGAs so that you can, so to speak, on the fly, have the FPGA part optimized to a recurring heavy-duty calculation. So that, that's my belief. You know, quantum computing, not in the next five years in terms of a real quantum computer. There might be simulations of quantum computing that you could... Uh, learn from and experiment with, but not a, a real operational quantum computer, regardless of what some companies say. I could be proven wrong, but that's my bet. Okay, well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>